All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Muscle Intelligence q and I'm your favorite host, Ashley, the Muscle Maven Van Houten, and I'm here with another guy you know. You're my favorite host, Ash. Ben Pikulski. Ben, how's it going? <laughs> I'm doing really well, actually. I'm doing really well. I've been in Toronto for a couple of weeks, doing lots of work, getting some workouts in, enjoying some time, catching up with great friends. She's just a lot of learning and a lot of really great conversations. So it's been an awesome couple of weeks. Awesome. Actually, I need to ask you, and I I think I've asked you this before as I've been in and out of Toronto and we just missed each other this time, unfortunately, but what's the good meathead gym in Toronto? Uh, I kind of make the rounds, to be honest. And this time, I've actually been going out to Burlington. I've been going out to Pure Fitness in Burlington, which is Dorian and Noah Hamilton. That's a sweet gym. They basically, you know, from there, modeled my gym and, and one-upped it. That was their goal. And they really did. They did a great job. Lots of great equipment, great atmosphere. So that's by far the best gym in the Toronto area. But it's probably 35 minutes for me, so it's a bit of a drive. I do uh, Fortis West, which is Dundas, which is nice. A little small piloting gym. I go to Torque Barbell sometime. That's usually pretty much it. Sometimes I go to System Fitness in High Park. Just kind of whatever, wherever the energy is pulling me that day, that's where I go. And I just keep it simple, man. I've been doing, I've been like keeping it super simple lately, just doing some really basic compounds, you know, really hard contractions, really trying to improve my mobility. I've been doing some really unique, interesting stuff for mobility lately. And it's not like just, hey, let's go into these positions and stretch, which a lot of people like to do. It's more focused on activation, activating short ranges of motion that really open up my range of motion. It really actually tax my CNS incredibly well. And I've noticed my mobility gone through the roof and my body just feels better. My HRV has gone up. And so there's been a lot of deep dives into these new paradigms around mobility and stability, which has been fun. Awesome. Where do you do your yoga in Toronto? I don't. I throw a mat down in the middle of the living room and I do it here. That's that's really it. Like, so there's a place apparently that's really great downtown, but I mean, if anyone lives or or knows Toronto, like I don't go east of the 427 if if at all possible, or at least east of High Park, because traffic is just ridiculous going downtown these days. And I try to kind of stay in my own little bubble. Cool. We have lots to talk about, but the first thing I got to get it out because I'm just like bursting. <laughs> I already know where this I'm is going. I'm bursting I heard you. <laughs> to ask you about it. And I've been getting so many questions, but mostly questions like, hey, find out what Ben thinks about this. So we have to talk about it. And that is, of course, the Game Changers Netflix documentary, which I'm sure knowing you, you have not watched, but we've also got Kai Green now, like going hard, deciding to be a vegan or something. I don't think he's doing that. So listen, here's here's the absolute reality of this and no one will be able to refute this. 10% of the population can do really well as a vegan. 10% of the population can do really well as a carnivore and everybody else falls in the middle of the bell curve, right? It's just a bell curve. This is the genetic predisposition of the human race. So if you're in that 10% of, of people who do well as a vegan, you can potentially thrive or at least exist as a vegan without health implications. If you're the 10% of people who can exist as a carnivore, you can thrive or at least exist as a carnivore. This doesn't mean that the rest of the 80% should be doing that. And and it's not healthy for most people, right? It's not even healthy for the people who fit in that 10% in most cases on both ends of the spectrum, both carnivore and vegetarian, right? Or vegan. I think, you know, if anything, you could probably make an argument. Well, you could probably make an argument for both, to be honest. You know, vegans could potentially be healthy if you have that right genetic predisposition. And same with carnivore. Right. Whereas if someone who should be a vegan goes carnivore, they're going to feel like crap. And there's like some energetic things or some energetic conversations there. Obviously, meat being a lot more grounding is going to be better for someone who tends to be a little bit flighty, tends to be a little bit aloof. They need to be a little more grounding energy and eat a little more meat. Someone who's a little bit too blah, a little bit too plain, a little bit is too grounded almost. Well, maybe they need more energy. Maybe they need more of that flighty energy, right? So give them more vegetables. And I think that's kind of the way I, I play with my my nutrients is now, I'm not someone who's going to be a carnivore or a vegan, to be honest. I'd like to do an experiment to see what happens but I'm also not dogmatically attached to either because I just think it's absolutely ridiculous. You know, 80% of the humans are, are meant to eat an omnivorous diet. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd argue even maybe higher than that number. But so when you were posting in your stories about like, should I do a vegan experiment? Were you trolling people? Or are you actually interested? No, no, no. I, I was actually thinking about it. So I was like, and, and to be honest, like, so here's here's why I will not do that. And I'll tell you guys right now that I'm not going to do it because 30 days isn't enough, right? If you're going to switch to a vegan diet to see any type of positive or negative, and I would believe it would probably be negative for me, 
health implications. It's going to take longer than that. It's going to take at least 90 days to change your microbiome, right? Like your microbiome will start to shift after 30 days, but it's going to take longer than that. And I'm just not willing to do vegan for 90 days. I just not willing to do it. So 30 days, it would almost be a waste of time. I would take a few steps backwards because my, my microbiome isn't adjusted to only eating that. I probably feel more energized, right? Because with the amount of meat that I eat, it's very grounding to me. So I would probably acutely feel more energized, which a lot of people go, I feel so good. I feel so energized. That makes sense because that's kind of the energy signature of, of fruits and vegetables, right? But here's the problem with me being a vegan. I'm not eating beans. I'm not eating soy. I'm not eating corn. No chance. I'm not eating tofu. There's no way. I just won't put those things in my body. So what the hell am I going to eat, right? I'm going to live off vegetables, sweet potatoes, and olive oil. And that's kind of what I do now anyways. I just add some meat on top. So I just don't think it makes any sense for me. And I think it would be a negative health step. So I even thought about doing 30 days of carnivore on the other end, just because just like, I feel like doing some type of dietary experiment and I think I should, but I want to have a little bit more than just like, Hey, I'm doing 30 days of carnivore again. I want to have like a little bit more of an objective in there. So I'm kind of looking within my health and I just actually got my blood markers back. And to be honest, for a guy who was a competitive professional bodybuilder for 20 years, my blood is flawless, you know, short of having slightly decreased luteinizing hormone, everything else was amazing which is awesome. So don't really have anything to chase after. I was kind of like, hey, maybe I'll have something here to chase. Maybe my, my thing to chase is just a higher level of performance in one or area. Or even just the learning, just right? Diet. Of like how you feel. Like it's just, yeah. just purely experimental, right? But 30 days isn't enough, yeah. right? 30 days is just not enough to, to actually get any objective change. I'm really glad you mentioned the, that though, because that is something that like... <sighs> The Kai Green thing, like I don't like to be conspiracy he's totally theorist, trolling, man. or he's being paid, right? Because it's one thing for for anybody to be like, I'm going to try this crazy experiment. I mean, it's a little bit weird for somebody who's a massive bodybuilder to try this, but like, it's one thing for him to say, okay, I'm going to try this because it's interesting and whatever. But it's another thing to literally watch the documentary and then like two days later be evangelizing all over the internet and telling Thor that he should be a vegetarian. Like it's a, I'm like, did he tell Thor that? Yes. <laughs> yes. He posted, Where? Okay. I, I posted this in my stories. I got to send you the link, but Thor posted on his Instagram, like a video of him, like eating a giant steak and he just labeled it carnivore yeah. and Kai Green commented under it. He's like, Thor, dude, like you got to try this vegan thing or vegetarian thing. And people like lost their shit. I'm like, Thor's 440 pounds with abs. Like he probably has to kill himself just to eat another enough meat to sustain his weight. Imagine mm -hmm. if he was trying to eat vegetables. Like it just. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about this actually objectively for a minute. Cause I think the listeners deserve to hear some objective feedback rather than just some opinions. So if you want to go on a vegan diet, I can say with a high degree of confidence that your blood markers acutely will probably not in any way get worse. Your lipid profiles may actually improve. If as long as you're not eating a bunch of sugar and a bunch of crappy fats, comes down to quality, right? So if I'm eating a bunch of fried foods, like vegan just still leaves the door open for bagels and donuts, right? Like I could still eat that junk. So if you did that, your blood markers are going to go off no matter what you do. So if you just ate really healthy foods, chances are your lipid profiles improve, your inflammation, depending on your genetics, may go up, may go down. But almost definitively, you're going to lose muscle mass. So like, are you going to consume tons of soy, tons of beans, tons of lentils? Maybe, but that's still not a great source of protein for you. And your body will definitely start to degrade. But how long will it take, right? The typical duration for most people who have gone vegan in the past are going to tell us somewhere between 12 and 36 months for their body to really start feeling crappy. You know, and if your objective is losing muscle, like I thought about going vegan because I'm like, hey, I want to lose a bunch of muscle. If that's your objective, go ahead and do it. But there's very few people in the world who should be doing that. Like I would be one of the only human beings on the planet who says, hey, I want to lose 30 pounds of muscle and actually be in my right mind in doing so. Most people are, should be thinking about retaining and gaining muscle, right? And now the other end of that is there's been some really interesting stirrings and rumblings around the negative implications of eating too many vegetables and fiber. And I think there's an interesting conversation to be had there. And again, I'm pretty sure it's a genotypic thing, right? It's a gene thing. Are you predisposed to having a microbiome or a gut wall that may be a little bit more predisposed to your typical IBS or your typical inflammatory diseases or uh, ailments of the GI tract. So objectively, if someone's thinking about doing this, you might feel better temporarily, no question, but pay attention to your health markers because there's 
no doubt that 80% of the population will certainly see a health decline with any prolonged vegan experiments. Okay. All right. We don't have to beat this to death. There are a ton of people online who are doing very research-based and intelligent responses to the documentary. Right. Gabrielle so, Lyons, one of them. Like, Go check those people out. I want to give the flip side of that, Ash, actually. I want to give the flip side of that. So, the bad side of eating a carnivore diet, right? Or even a ketogenic diet. There's some negative implications there that people just don't consider, right? When you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. People attach onto one thing that works for them and they think it's a great idea. There's negative implications on eating carnivore and keto too, right? So our society en masse is an overstressed society. So people don't realize that carbohydrates have a tremendous effect, a tremendous benefit in modulating cortisol, bringing down cortisol, the stress hormone, right? If you're someone who goes off of carbohydrates, your body's just lost that huge lever that it needs and uses to modulate cortisol. Now, if you're someone who has a genetic predisposition to being stressed, or if you have a lifestyle that's predisposing you to a bunch of stress, that's a terrible idea, terrible idea. So they've showed across the board, and I've seen this across the board, that people on a ketogenic diet have lower heart rate variability. People on a ketogenic diet have lower deep sleep and usually lower REM sleep. And most of the people listening who are on a ketogenic diet will attest to that. Your numbers go down, your, your HRV and your sleep numbers go down. That's not a good thing for performance. That's not a good thing for cognition. That's not even a good thing for longevity, right? You got to pay attention to those things. So my suggestion, ladies and gents, is don't be dogmatic. If you're, if I'm stressed, eat some carbohydrates. If I'm training really hard, eat some carbohydrates, right? If, if you're sitting on your ass all day, you don't need any carbohydrates, right? So I think there needs to be an objective thought process with everything that goes into your mouth, right? It's not just like, hey, I feel like going vegan for three months, even though I'm training for a bodybuilding show. No, man, that's stupid. You need protein. Or, hey, man, I feel like going keto for a while, even though I'm training for an endurance race or even though I'm training for bodybuilding. Like, no, man, like your body needs those macronutrients. So, you know, just to give everyone the flip side, showing that I'm not being dogmatic about this, like on mass, I would lean on the side of, of doing more meats. But I, I mean, if I'll, if I'll be honest with you, I still eat a ton of vegetables. Like, you know, my, my life looks like I eat a huge bowl of vegetables at every meal, a, you know, a good serving of meat and then a ton of fat on top. And that's kind of it. And most of my fat, as I always talk about, is from olive oil. Like I, I got my blood results back, Ash. I did a kind of really extensive blood profile, which gave me back all my fatty acid uh, ratios, a huge amount of oleic acid and, and linoleic acid, which is both uh, kind of derivatives of That's because you drink my, a my wine glass full oil. of high quality olive oil every day, Ben. <laughs> I have about 60 grams of olive oil, maybe more than that, maybe like 60 to 75 grams on every meal, which is like five to six tablespoons typically. I just kind of pour it. Like I just drench it until they're the bottom of the bowl or, or plate is covered. Okay. So listen, <laughs> again, like talking about this stuff, it makes me get fired up just because I completely agree with what you're saying about none of us should be dogmatic. We have to realize there's bio-individuality. We have to realize that even within individuals, we're changing our goals and our requirements and our whatever all the time. And that most of us fit into this broad spectrum in the middle rather than these extremes that we keep hearing about on the internet. But it's really, really hard for people to be objective, even in the face of actual science and fact, because for food, seemingly more than almost anything except maybe religion, people take it so personally. It's such a personal choice. And there's so much morality or lack thereof attached to the way we eat. And so it makes it really, really hard, I think, sometimes for people to look at the facts and still be able to make an educated decision for some reason, because we're just so attached to what the way we eat says about us, you know? Yeah. And I think we're tribal beings, right? And we want people to attach to us for what we do and they want to follow us. Us or they want us to follow them or, or whatever, right? It's, it's this tribal mentality of, if I do this, I want people who are like-minded and are going to do the same thing to be around me. And I get it. So you need to have an identity. Like everyone's trying to create an identity for themselves so that they can identify who they want to hang out with. And sometimes I wonder if people are choosing their diet based on the people that go like, hey, I'd rather look like that person. So therefore, I'm going to choose that diet rather than actually what's best for me, right? I look like, like a guy, look at a guy like my buddy, Danny Vega, People look at him and go, man, like that guy was pretty much got the perfect physique, right? He's absolutely shredded. He's got the perfect amount of muscle. He's healthy. He's got great endurance. He's a carnivore. Therefore, I should be a carnivore. And well, no, you're not Danny Vega. He's got very different genes than you do. So maybe I want to look like him. Maybe I'll, I'll eat more on the side of that, but maybe there's still some variations in there based on my genetics and my lifestyle and, and 
other things I like to do that maybe means I should eat like, okay, let's eat 75% carnivore and then 25% is all these other things that kind of allow me to eat for my environment and for my stress and for my genetics. And, you know, rather than just dogmatically attaching to, well, I want to do everything Danny does because he's really cool. I think you just need to acknowledge, well, you're not that person. You're your own person and, and create your own identity. And maybe people will follow you for your identity. Yeah. And it doesn't matter at the end of the day. It really doesn't matter if people on Instagram think you're cool if you're unhealthy or eating in a way that you yeah, don't nobody like. Nobody gives a shit. Yeah. Do you know Alex Viata? Uh, the name sounds familiar. So he's a good friend of mine from San Diego and I absolutely love this guy. And and I don't know if he's got a shirt about it yet, but he, it's one of his quotes that he kind of made famous and I'm sure everybody else uses it, but he just says, nobody cares. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, everyone's like, you're walking on the treadmill. Oh, everybody's looking, nobody cares. Yeah. What, nobody eat, what you eat, nobody cares. Truthfully, nobody gives a shit. Oh, I look fat in this. Nobody except for you cares, right? And, and you need to acknowledge that as people are so uh, egocentric that, and they're so worried about what other people think. And the reality is the only one everyone else thinks about is themselves too. So who fucking cares? Just do what's best for you. Be healthy so you can live a long, happy life. Create your own identity. Be happy with you first. And then, okay, great. Now, now we can start building on that, right? Anyways, there's my lesson for the day. Let's all just accept our inherent narcissism and move on. <laughs> Well, it's reality, yeah, isn't it? I know. Like, it's like very unconscious. True. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The desire to, to procreate and exist. Yep. And eat. Okay. But you mentioned stress and cortisol. And that actually leads into a question that I wanted to ask you that we got on social media about. And I think I know the answer to this, but maybe speak to it a little bit. When you're trying to lose fat and improve body composition, what should you attack first? your stress, your exercise, or your nutrition? Yeah. You know, Ash, if you asked me this a month ago, I might have given you a different answer, but it's shifted a little bit. And, and the answer is it completely depends on who you are. So the more I study heart rate variability, the more I realize that this has to be the thing that determines that answer. So we have a genetic predisposition to be either more sympathetic or more parasympathetic, right? You meet some people who from the time they're children, they're very chilled out, they're very relaxed, they're very calm, they're very grounded. You meet some people who are very you know, high pace, talk really fast, move really fast from the time they're children. And then everyone's usually kind of somewhere in the middle, kind of like this, this diet thing. Well, it's the same thing with heart rate variability or with at least personality types, I guess what you may call a personality type. And Depending where you sit on that continuum, you know, further to the parasympathetic or fair, further to the sympathetic will determine how you should respond to that. So someone who's more sympathetically oriented, meaning they have more of a stress predisposition, they maybe don't have sleep as well, you know, their heart rate's up a little bit, kind of like you, Ash. You're someone who stays up a little later, have a hard time falling asleep. You're probably more go, go, go. Your brain can't slow down. Well, for you, the first thing you need to do is manage stress, right? And, you know, you manage stress sometimes by increasing carbohydrates. You manage stress sometimes by doing more aerobic training. For you to add more high-intensity cardio and weight training on top of it, just adding to the sympathetic stress could actually put you into a position where you're going to burn less fat, right? It's because you're, you're giving your body more stress. Whereas someone on the other end of the spectrum who's a parasympathetic person, maybe they have a hard time getting energy to train. They feel a little lethargic. They need that cup of coffee to get out of bed. You know, maybe they have, they're have they a good sleeper. Maybe they can get to bed really early or they feel like they're just maybe a little bit more lethargic all the time. Well, that person may need more sympathetic stress. So that person may do really well with high intensity training. They may do really well with you know high volume, high frequency uh, weight training. And those are completely ends of the different ends of the spectrum. Now, that's genetic pre positions. And then you just add like another layer of complexity on top of that with lifestyle, because, you know, if someone's a parasympathetic person, but has a huge amount of stress in their life because of their chosen lifestyle or current lifestyle, well, then that adds a whole different dimension. So then it just comes down to this objective measure of like, okay, well, where am I right now? And, and the only way to check that is with heart rate variability. So if your heart rate variability is low, now here's the thing. When I say low, People think, oh, well, what's high, what's low? I have no idea. It depends on where you start. What's your baseline for Ashley, right? Or for whoever the question is coming from. So if you're a sympathetically dominant person to begin with, Ash, chances are your HRV is not going to be awesome anyways, right? You're not going to have a huge amount of HRV just to begin with. So let's say your good number for you is like 60. Well, if you're in the tens, well, that's a problem. So let's make sure you're getting more parasympathetic activity. If you're in the sixties or fifties, okay, well, that's great. Then now that means we can start to push a little bit more, right? So you have to just kind of have this jumping off point for you so that you know, hey, this is where I am on a normal week. Okay, well, this is where it kind of fluctuates to. Okay, well, what should I do? How can I kind of keep myself in this level or ideal zone 
by using training as a tool. So here's how we do that. Anything that's stressful to your body, anything that require that creates an internal stress, including fasting, including training, including high intensity cardio, including hot saunas and cold baths, those things are going to cause a sympathetic response, meaning they're going to cause more of a stress response. So that can push you up wherever you're starting. And the other end of that is, well, breathing and meditating and walking and, and, and loving people. And those things are more parasympathetic. And, and if you're someone who needs a parasympathetic stimulus, you got to have a tool belt. You got to, hey, like I, I noticed my HRV is very low. So therefore I should have more of a parasympathetic response or stimulus in my day to day, right? And someone who has a high amount of stress, well, don't do fasting. Don't do ketogenic dieting because that's the stuff your body needs to actually modulate the stress. Mm-hmm. Yep. Does that make sense, yep. Ash? It makes sense. Okay. I don't know if it's too complex. I try to talk in really, it's really simple language. It's not too complex. It's just kind um, of, I think, a reminder to everybody that even people as educated and experienced as you, and we get this platform to ask you questions, like there is no simple answer. It's not like Ben can tell you, like, here's what you do first, and here's what you do next, and then you're all going to be sorted out. Like, you really need to do the work of understanding your body really intimately and deeply in order to even set benchmarks to understand how to get better. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing some documents on this now and I'll give it away. So I should hopefully be done, depending how many days I actually stay in Toronto, I might actually finish it this week. If I do, I'll make sure it's up on the website by the end of the month or actually it'll be early next month. So people can kind of have an idea of how to do this stuff. Because I know it's a little bit complex, but um, you know, here's the crazy thing. There's not a lot of people in the world who understand this stuff. There's, there's maybe a handful and we're kind of creating a little bit of a collective. So we're going to have a three-day mastermind with all kind of the world's greatest HRV experts in one place. And I'm not one of those experts. I'm just someone who happens to put myself in, in the position to be in the room just because I'm organizing it. So I'm bringing all these people together. I guess I'm kind of the glue that binds. And I'm pumped about this because you have this huge separation between people who are doing it in practice and people who are doing it in, in theory and research. And so I'd like to bring them together and just kind of hopefully push the level of understanding beyond what it is now. Okay. That's exciting. You're going to have to keep all of us posted on when you have more information about this mastermind. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Before I get to the next question, speaking of events and things that I'm very excited about, you've got another muscle camp coming up soon, just in case there's still, when this goes live, there's still spaces. So November 8th through 10th is the last muscle camp of the year in Tampa, Florida. Three days, Ashley Van Houten's going to be there. Yeah. So if you you aren't motivated to go because Ben's teaching you for three days straight, just know that I'm going to be there like a goofball sitting in the back. So show (laughs) up. Flexing those, flexing the guns. Exactly. So I know we do still have spots left because I haven't actually told anybody that it's happening. I just kind of forgot it was there. And I was like, oh man, we got a camping in like a couple of weeks. So love to have a couple people there. I think we've got four or five spots left to be honest. And you guys can check that out at my40gym.com. You can also go to musclecamps.com. Musclecamps.com has historically been the site I used with Jordan, Dr. Shallow, but he's not part of this camp. It's just going to be myself teaching this camp and the amazing coaches I have at my gym. Lots of focus around training, lots of focus on improving training for your body, lots of focus around, I'm going to teach uh, HRV stuff, I'm going to teach breathing, a little bit of breathing stuff, I'm going to teach a little bit of energy system stuff so you can learn how the application of the breathing and the HRV because those things tie in together really well. So it's really going to be like everything you need to go into burning fat and building muscle and optimizing your internal environment, right? And I talk about this often as so everyone's so focused on the external stimulus. How much should I lift and how should I periodize? And it's all nonsense, man. Like the objective is what is the internal response I'm trying to create? What is the internal environment I need to create to, to elicit this change in my body? And that's different for everybody. So if, if you guys can start getting your head around, forget about the external stimulus, right? The external stimulus matters, of course, but only in as much as that if it creates the internal response I'm after. So that's kind of the disconnect a lot of people have. They're just focused on the external, which and like, I'm not getting results. Yeah, no shit, you're not getting results. You're doing everything that's wrong for you. So that's what I teach is like, I want to give everyone who leaves that place a skill set so they can feel empowered to build their greatest body. So it's a three-day camp, nine to five every day. It's really cheap for what you're getting. And I'd say 99% of people, there's been one person in the six years that I've done it that, that hasn't told me it was a life-changing experience. Is and that person dead is to you now? The one person who didn't like it? No, not at all, man. I, I actually invited him back and I said, hey, man, listen, if, if I didn't do a good enough job this first time, something was missing. So the reason it wasn't a good enough job is because ironically, this camp actually had 
I think 20 people. Normally, we, we cap it at 15. And it was a little bit too many people for the number of coaches. And he goes, I didn't get enough individual attention. I think there was five coaches for 20 people. And I, and I get it. So normally, we do like you know, two to three people per coach. So if we have 15 people, we'll have five coaches about. So you're getting a lot of individualized attention. And this, this one, I guess we just oversold it. And it happens sometimes. If I don't shut it down, I don't pay attention how many people are coming. People get pissed off. And I, I was like, I get it. So normally when you come to camps with G, Jordan and I, or next year I'm doing with Milos Sarchev, uh, I haven't told anybody about that yet. But if we do too many people, you don't get a lot of individual attention because I'm so focused on making sure people are getting the attention they need. There just happened to be one dude who I just didn't give a lot of attention to. And I apologize to him, invited him back for a free camp. That's still a pretty good track record. So, and I'm just super pumped to go to the yeah. gym for the first time. I've never been to the gym. Oh my goodness. I'm so pumped. Okay. So we'll put, we'll put the link in the show notes too. So people can just check that out. They can go straight from there if they want to get a ticket. Yeah. Just go to mi40gym.com. There's a link or go to musclecamps.com. I'll take you right there. Now I just let something get something out of the bag that I do want to announce right now that Milos Sharchev, who is one of my greatest mentors the sport, you know, guy who trained me for one of my best show appearances ever. Him and I are going to be doing some camps in Australia and Ireland and UK this year, which will be fun. So obviously Jordan and I did them last year, had an awesome time. And Milos has been reaching out to me and saying, hey man, let, let's let's do some stuff. So I love the guy and we have very different approaches. He's just about effort. He's like, hey man, I'm just going to beat you into the ground. Whereas I'm going to come in and kind of give the opposite of that. Like, hey, I'm going to teach you how to do this stuff right for you. I'm going to teach you how to modulate all this stress and fix all this internal environment. And then Milos is just going to beat you into the ground. So I think there's a combination of people who really love that. And I just want to take the scientific approach and, you know, combine it with the effort. So it'll be fun. So uh, and again, dates aren't announced yet, but I, I can guarantee you it will be the first three weeks of February in Australia, the last week of February in New Zealand, and two weeks in the UK, the first two weeks of April. Very cool. I think that's another sort of really important part of the education that you offer is that you're always so willing and in fact, seek out having people partner with you or work with you that have different perspectives, right? Because so often, like you, you talk about this a lot, like not being myopic and not looking at just one thing or being super, super focused on one modality or one effort. And I think having people come and teach these things with you that come from different backgrounds and different perspectives or whatever, I think that's really, really valuable for people. So that's cool. Well, Milos is maybe the guy that I respect most in professional bodybuilding. Him and Dorian Yates are up there. And again, I don't want to, that's not throwing anybody else in the bus saying I don't respect them, but Milos is so unbelievably brilliant and so unbelievably driven. Like he's still in his 50s and he's 4% body fat training his butt off every day. Like I love that, man. I love consistency and he's just real and he's so brilliant. And to be honest, I just want to kind of hang out with him. I want to, I want to help him out, have him, have him build his, his following a little bit and have some fun, man. Have some really crazy hard workouts. I think we're going to train together every day for three weeks. So I'll probably end up putting on 30 pounds again because <laughs> that's what happens when I train hard. As long as you're not eating a vegetarian diet then. <laughs> So one kind of related question, and this is going to be really generic, but I know that it's something you've been kind of thinking about a little bit. So I want to just like let you go and, and rant in this general direction because you get a lot of questions about it. And that is training volume. People are asking it from every direction, like to either maintain muscle mass or gain it or longevity or whatever. What are your thoughts right now on training volume? Well, so this conversation around periodization exists, right? And there's there's actually some really interesting data coming out now from Jeremy Linecki, and, and I just sent you over his contact. Hopefully, we'll get him on the podcast soon. This conversation around does periodization matter in hypertrophy training? So I want people to acknowledge that periodization is a term that was created by a guy named Tudor Bampa out of York University here in Toronto, and it had everything to do with athletics. And, and his his conversation was around speed. He was generating, you know, he was the best guy in the world for speed. Ben Johnson's famous trainer also a professor at York University. So his conversation on periodization was specific to sports. And, and to me, that makes a lot of sense. We're trying to peak for a, a sprint or like a 100 meters, or we're trying to peak for a season or something. And periodization in that sense, and even in bodybuilding can make, can make a degree of sense. But I think people need to acknowledge that there's certainly the opposite side of the coin where periodization may not be as necessary or as useful for 99, maybe 98% of the population as people think. So the way I, I suggest people approach is just going back to this heart rate variability conversation where if you can acknowledge that you're someone who's really, really sympathetically oriented, meaning you tend to be a little bit more driven, you have a little bit hard time sleeping, you tend to be a little bit more, uh, your brain just kind of goes and goes and goes. 
you probably don't need a huge amount of stimulus. You probably don't need a huge amount of work. You're probably more likely to want to train in the afternoon. You probably want to have a couple meals in because you need that carbohydrate to kind of calm you down in the morning because you tend to get too up. Those are the type of people that are very sympathetic and probably don't need a huge amount of training volume because if they have too much training volume, their body's going to start to break down. Their body's going to start to go too sympathetic and the body starts to become cortisol dominant and start breaking down. The other end of that spectrum is people who are more parasympathetic, which is most bodybuilders. So most bodybuilders are very parasympathetic. So that means they have a hard time getting up in the morning. Like get, when I say getting up, I mean getting really energized. They wake up in the morning, they're a little bit flat. But they use that cortisol in the morning to really fuel a workout. You know, so I'm the perfect example. If if I wait till like 12 or 2 in the afternoon to train, I'm a bag of potatoes. Like I suck. I need that morning cortisol to fuel the sympathetic drive that I need to get a great workout. So I need that, uh, you know, that cortisol. I, I need cortisol. Or like an example being, I don't get into a workout for the first 30 to 45 minutes. Like that's when the workout starts for me. And a lot of people, other people are, should be ending workouts at 40 minutes, right? If you're really sympathetic, you have a heart, you have an easy time getting really aroused, hyper aroused. Well, then you can very easily work hard, get out, right? Whereas someone who's parasympathetic, man, I feel like my workout's just getting started after 45 minutes. And that's just the reality. So there's a very interesting, long-winded explanation around how much training you should be doing, how long you should be training, just based around coming back to this heart rate variability piece. And I hope everyone is aware now of the reality of how important this is. And I take kind of this autonomic view of training, meaning the autonomic nervous system and heart rate variability. I think it should be guiding training, should be guiding nutrition, should be guiding recovery. And it's this objective marker that we all have to look at that can tell us where our body sits. Now, measuring this cannot be done through the wrist. So if someone's wearing a watch and they think they're getting HRV, it's not accurate. It has to be a chest strap or, or the aura ring is very accurate. Not as accurate as a chest strap, but it's very accurate as well. So if everyone is not already a customer of Aura, I, I don't have... Actually, we do have a direct link, don't we, Ash? We have a, we have a discount code. Again, it wasn't the objective of me saying that, but I think we have a $50 code, which we can throw on the show notes. But again, I'm not trying to push people to go get that. I just think it's that important. I, I'm also recently attached to or become associated with a company called First Beat. And again, no financial commitment there or no financial uh, relationship, just a really, really good company, uh, really accurate HRV measures. And we're doing some really interesting stuff with research. Cool. So, All right. Well, since we're talking about companies that you like, let's talk about a company that you officially like, because you and I actually had decided we were going to have a conversation about this since we had a conversation about partnering with them. And that's ChiliPad. And I've been using a ChiliPad for about a month. You've been using their new product, an Uller, Uller for a few weeks oh, now. Man, so good. <laughs> Did you get the Uller as well or did you get the chili pad? I didn't, but we. this is a good, like, let's quote air quote right now, authentic conversation about this because you like the Uller more than the chili pad. I actually really like the chili pad. So let's like talk about the differences here. All right. I'll, yeah, I'll give, you my, I'll give you my honest feedback. So I had the chili pad for the better part of a month and I didn't like it because any sound in my room destroys my sleep. Like I need darkness. So my nervous system is very much like if if somebody goes yeah. when I'm sleeping, I wake up. <laughs> like I'm, I have a very hyper aware nervous system. So any amount of white noise when I'm sleeping wakes me up. So I didn't have good deep sleep with the, with the chili pad. So when I got the Uller, which is about, I had about two weeks of, of the Uller use. The benefit of the Uller that I liked, it's a newer unit, gets a little bit colder and you can choose to turn the white noise off. So with the chili pad, I think they intentionally kept the white noise on. And it's almost like a, a low-level fan. But it was enough that it, for whatever reason, disrupted my deep sleep. So in the beginning, it felt really, really good. And then after a few days, I was like, man, my deep sleep consistently hasn't been as low as it normally is. Or sorry, as high as it normally is. So when I got the Uller and I was able to put it on silent, my deep sleep went up like a good 50% bump. And I'm consistently getting up around two hours every night now because of that. And I mean, it, it typically was around an hour 15, hour around 20. And now I'm consistently getting two hours because of the Uller. And, and that's awesome. So I said, here's how I said it. I said it to be really cold in the middle of the night. So it's got an app. So I can set it to be 55 degrees in the middle of the night. And it's been amazing, like just incredible for my sleep numbers, getting deep sleep early in the night. And then I set it to warm up at like 4.30. So it started, the temperature starts to go up. So that actually the heat starts waking me up, the warmth. 
is something that wakes me up and I've just loved it. So how's That's you cool. and you're, you're a big fan of the chili pad. Yeah, it is cool though. Like the sort of technology advances with the Uller, but I mean, first of all, I just want to say, I know everyone hates when podcasts talk about their sponsors, but like, let's be real for a minute. Like we have sponsors because we care about these companies and they're offering discounts to you guys. So I know everybody hates it, but like, I feel like this is a very authentic conversation because you are fully like, I didn't even like one of these products, but I liked another one. So anyway. Uh, yeah, Ash, I, I mean, the reality is without sponsors, we can't have a podcast, right? We need, we need, there's production costs and as much as we hate it, like it's part of part of life. And it's not like we're, we're making a huge amount of cash off this, right? Like I literally don't take a dollar of this stuff. It's just like, it's enough to make the the podcast run. So having a co-host costs money guys. Like let's be real. <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, I don't get out of bed for less than one chili pad. Anyway, okay, we're veering <laughs> off track, but let me tell you about my experience with chili pad because I actually, I really liked it. I mean, this is definitely, it's their first and like more basic model, right? Like, as you said, Uller has other like additional options and sort of more technologies that you can manipulate and play with it a little bit more. But the chili pad, and I'm like you, like I joke that I'm like Chuck Norris. I don't like sleep. I just wait for the morning to come. Like I'm just like lying there, like waiting, like I'm the lightest sleeper in the world. Like if somebody walks in and is like, Hey Ashley, like quietly at like four in the morning, I'm going to be like, yeah, what's up? Like I'm not a deep sleeper generally. But when I got the chili pad, I actually found that sort of low level hum white noise. I don't know if it's helping me necessarily, but it's definitely not hurting me, which I was worried that it would. And it didn't, it does not affect my ability to get to sleep whatsoever. And I got the chili pad in this in like the middle of August when it was like key hotness in Canada and it worked for me like I turned it down to I don't know what like 58 like as low as it goes and it's it doesn't freeze you out it just kind of like you know when you get into a bed and it's like those cool crisp sheets like when you first slide in it like keeps it like that all night long right it's like it's amazing right yeah and I think it's important to acknowledge that you can make it warm yes. so for people like getting into a warm bed in the winter time like you can actually make it I think my son <laughs> funny my son was goofing around with it because he sleeps with us sometimes uh, and he put it up to 110 or something. I think it was like 108. And so I woke up in the morning. I'm like, why am I burning? <laughs> What's going on? My son was goofing with it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was just going to say. I have been turning it on to hot for like the last month. Because of course, Canada goes from like August you know, 30th, it's summer. And then like September 1st, it's winter. And I immediately started turning it on just at the beginning of like, just when I like, because again, the opposite of the summer, I want to like slip into the sheets and they're kind of warm. Like they're not freezing cold because it's cold outside. And yeah, it's just like, it's nice and warm. You can turn it off when you feel like it. Like it doesn't have any like kind of app or like special stuff like the Uller does. But for somebody who just wants that little bit of like customization, maybe a little bit of white noise, you can cool your bed, heat your bed, turn it off when, whenever you want. I mean, it's just basic, but it works. Works. And for somebody who does struggle with sleep and needs every little kind of detail will help. You know what I mean? Chili pad has worked for me. So I think it's worth people maybe checking out the website and seeing like which one would be better for them because it is an investment. And the Uller obviously is going to cost more because it's a fancier, newer product, bottom line. But we do have a discount, right? Do you have that? Yeah. Muscle Sleep for 15% off. So if you go to Chili Pad, is it chilipad.com? I think it's chilipad.com. Well, we actually have a specific, like a direct link. So Got I'll it. just put that in the show notes. But yeah. Yeah, if you, yeah, you have 15% off for either one. So check it out. And then maybe also if you want, if you have any like additional questions or you want us to have more hashtag real talk about these products online, like just send me at Muscle Intelligence Podcast on Instagram, like ask questions and we'll answer them. But these are kind of like our initial, I guess, thoughts after using it for a bit. So there's one more thing, Ash, that I want to bring up before we head out. And I forgot that I'm actually going to be doing a one-day seminar in Vancouver, Canada, November 22nd. It's a Friday. It'll be a nine-to-five seminar held at West Coast Iron. So if anybody's interested in that, send me a DM on Instagram, and I'll hook you guys up with a website to be able to sign up for that. It's going to be a really small group, not overly expensive. There's going to be a, a small cost involved just because it's only a single day. It'll be one workout and a whole bunch of education around training and heart rate variability. So anybody's in the Vancouver area or wants to fly in for a day, I'm going to be there November 22nd. Yeah, November 22nd, West Coast Iron, Vancouver, Canada. And the only other thing we want to touch on before we roll is our habit of the week. What is it, Ash? Habit of the week, easier said than done, social media break. Yeah, I think uh, social media sabbatical is important and I'm actually going to do it. So after I just told people to send me a message on DM. Don't do uh, it. Are you going to do it? What are we going to look at on Instagram though? 
Well, you can post for me. Okay. I'll send you pictures and, and all my, my details of okay. my life. I'll probably, I guarantee if I do that, we'll be posting more. I'll send you two to three things a day. I'm like, hey, here's what I'm doing now. So I always do better when someone else is posting for me. I just hate going on there because it's just such a time suck. I go on for five minutes to post and it's been an hour later and you're done responding to your 700 DMs. Yeah, it's true. And before you, yeah. before we talk about that even more, I just want to like really explicitly tell people because your Instagram, like I love your Instagram and I love that you post like a bunch of educational stuff as well as like really personal stuff. I think it's very cool for someone as popular as you to share what you do share. But I just want people to know if they're not paying attention that there is an Instagram account for the podcast podcast specifically, and it's uh, at Muscle Intelligence Podcast. And you're much better off if you have a question or a suggestion or a guest, you're much better off going there because me or Ben or whoever is more likely to see what you're asking over there. Because as you just said, like you get a zillion messages a day and just stuff's going to slip through the cracks. So if you have something you want us to address on the podcast, go to at Muscle Intelligence Podcast on Instagram and put it there. Absolutely. So there's nothing else to really talk about with social media sabbatical. I, I think it's almost disturbing how much we use social media and it's built to be addictive. And I actually watch uh, myself and other people's actions on uh, and how the what apps evolve. And like, man, they're putting things in there all the time to make it more addictive. They just added that one feature where the, I don't know if you get this too, Ash, but where you can see who's tagged you in their uh, yeah. stories. Have you, you see that? Yeah. So, I mean, that's just another means of addicting you. Like you're getting a dopamine hit. Go, hey, look, all these people are liking me. Hey, all these people are tagging me in their stories. And if you read Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport, we really got to get him on. I'd love to get that guy on. He's the best. Yeah. Talking about this stuff, like just, hey, man, stay off. You're just being manipulated. We're just all a bunch of automaton robots being manipulated by the powers. And it's sad, but it it is what it is, man. And you got to learn to control it. You got to learn to be aware of the reality that, you know, you're not controlling your thoughts. Somebody else is controlling your thoughts. Somebody else is controlling your actions. And that sucks, man. So that's why I think, you know, to be honest, I'm going to set myself up very soon to where I don't have to run my social media and someone else is doing it for me. And, and everyone would probably know there's been times when other people have run it. It's just, I don't know, sometimes they don't do a great job and sometimes they're not as authentic. And, and you know, sometimes it just doesn't work out from a employee employer relationship perspective. Yeah. I mean, well, that's the issue is a lot of people do use it for professional purposes too. But I think, and if you read digital minimalism, I actually got to interview Cal for paleo magazine radio, which was one of my favorite interviews ever. Why you got to one up me like that? Huh? <laughs> we'll get, we'll, we'll sort you guys out too. Like you'll get them, but no, but it was one of my favorite interviews ever because it was such a, and the book too is just such a positive and actionable look at how to use social media rather than have social media use you. Like we all accept that it is a very insidious platform that is meant to suck your time and make you feel like garbage, honestly. However, for many people, it is sort of an inevitable part of their day for whatever reason. And there are ways that you can be mindful and appropriate with it. And if you're just, you just have to really like stick to your guns. You really have to set limitations for yourself and just use it instead of having it use you. you. And I, I mean, it's easier said than done for sure, but there are ways you can, you can work around it. So when you do your sabbatical, like how long are you going? Are you just going to like hit the road? See you later. But. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the honest truth. If I didn't have children, I wouldn't have a cell phone. That's the hundred yeah. percent honest truth. Like that's my personality. I, I would just I would just throw it away, and I would never use it again. And I would just figure it out. You know, like I, I learned how to snowboard by going the top of the highest black diamond. I, that's the way my brain works. So that's what I would do. I would just like, hey, here's my phone, gone. In in due time, that will happen. Like I'm going to get my kids the bat signal, and they'll just be able to shine into the sky. Love it. It's just going to be like a super jacked down. guy like doing a <laughs> yoga pose, and that's that's you. You'll, <laughs> that's, that's you'll exactly, follow. You'll follow yeah. wherever the light is. I mean, I guess too. <laughs> like you, when you're successful enough too, like you know that obviously you exist outside of social media, 100%. That's where you exist. But when it comes to work, a lot of times people feel like, well, if I wrote the story or if I did this podcast or I met with this person or I did this and I don't post about it, like, will anyone know? Does it matter if no one sees it? You've kind of reached a point where maybe that's a, a little bit less important for you because you're, of I course- I just don't give a shit. I mean, there's that too, but yeah. a lot of people are like, well, I'm not making the money I want to make yet. I'm not as successful as I want to be yet. And so I need yeah. to use this tool. Yeah. But like you said, even if you take a step back and aren't using social media anymore, you will most likely still have that platform, even if it's just not you looking at it. Well, here's my perspective, Ash. Everyone wants to be an influencer and I don't want to be an influencer. I want to influence people with 
with knowledge, with motivation, with inspiration. I don't give a shit if people like me. I just want to impact the people who I come in contact with, right? Like I don't want to have 8 million followers. Like it's, it's honestly a blessing and a curse to have that many people following you. I have no desire to be famous. Like I have a desire to help. Whether or not those things need to be or can be mutually exclusive, I don't know. But I'm not going to go out there and drop my pants and show my ass to be famous so that I can make a few dollars. Like I'd rather just impact the people that are right in front of me in the best way that I can. And that will grow and that will be more than enough to make enough income for any human being, right? So I think that's maybe the, the disconnect that people miss is they're too busy fucking around on their phone and they miss the people right in front of them, the ones that actually could, they could be impacting, they could be helping, right? You know, people in the gym, like, yeah, I need to find clients. So let me just post on so Instagram while I'm working out. Why don't you just go help the person right beside you improve their workout? And then all of a sudden, maybe they'll post for you, right? That's the way I approach this is like, I would rather do so much great stuff in this world that I have people posting about how awesome their experience is or how much I've helped them or, or you know, how awesome of a person I am rather than me having to go tell the world, right? When you're, when you're great at something, the world will tell you. And that's always been my perspective. Oh, that's so good. That's such a good place to end. It's, and I mean, it's just so ironic too that, you know, the people who don't care about everyone loving them and adoring them on social media are the people who do get the great positive feedback because your sincerity and your authenticity shows through. So I think that that's very good food for thought for people as we end off today. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Thanks for tuning in. As always, we're so grateful for you. We've got some, Ash, I mean, I want to give you a shout out because we've got some awesome, awesome feedback and nothing's happened other than you coming on the show. Like I'm certainly no different than I've always been. So I'm super grateful for you being here. Thank you so much. This has been an incredible experience for me so far and I'm going to stick around until you kick me off. So yeah, you're pretty cool. So <laughs> uh, everyone, thank you very much for tuning in. And please, as always, if you love the podcast, we'd love to hear from you. It, it definitely drives our motivation. It drives more people being able to hear the podcast. So if you guys could leave us a review on iTunes, we would massively appreciate it. And uh, tell Ashley how awesome she is on Instagram at The Muscle Maven. And tell me your questions and any way we've impacted you on the Muscle Intelligence podcast on Instagram. We're at Deepak Fitness on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Massive shout out to you guys. Mucho's respect and peace and love. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.